Hi, I'm Bill Crystal, and I'm very pleased to be joined by Chris Demuth. We're going to discuss the Contemporary Thinkers series of websites that Chris mm -hmm. has done an awful lot to, to put together. Uh, what's, why, 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 why Contemporary Thinkers? The Contemporary Thinkers sites are about uh, important, path-breaking thinkers of about the past century. Uh, there are some, uh, such as Friedrich Hayek, and John Maynard Keynes and Joseph Schumpeter, who were working all the way back in the 19 teens and 20s, uh, but it turned out did their great work uh, during the Depression, the war, a little bit immediately after the war. Uh, there are others uh, who came to prominence in the 1950s, uh, trying to come to grips with the rise of totalitarianism and uh, its continuance. Uh, in some parts of the world, uh, people like uh, Raymond Aron and uh, Leo Strauss uh, and uh, uh, Hannah Arendt, uh, Simone de Beauvoir, uh, dealing with new issues that post-war prosperity was, uh, was creating. Uh, the 1960s and 1970s was another <coughs> period of tumultuous uh, change and revolution, uh, and uh, a new school of thinkers, the neoconservatives, your father, Irving Kristol. Uh, and others such as uh, Nathan Glazer, uh, uh, other schools of thought, Samuel Huntington, uh, trying to, uh, uh, to understand the demands of diplomacy uh, in uh, the new world. All the way up to uh, the current time uh, when we have thinkers as, uh, uh, from different perspectives, Harvey Mansfield, uh, Charles Murray, uh, uh, Tom Wolfe, and Tom Sowell. Right. Uh, Martha Durthick until her death just a few months ago, who are working on the most contemporary problems. But all of them uh, having in common uh, that they're working on problems at a very, very high level of intellectual rigor uh, and are uh, creating systems of understanding problems out there in the world that in some cases have lasted now for a century. Uh, and in others have lasted for many decades and stand some chance of lasting uh, a century or more into the future. And of course, we'll be adding other thinkers uh, as, as, as the time first, goes along, yes. the first wave. So, so these are all thinkers we obviously think uh, it's, that it's important their work be preserved and made much more easily accessible to Correct. students and others today. That's the, that's the point of this whole enterprise. Um, what struck you in? I'd say we don't. Uh, you and I wouldn't always uh, agree right. with them. We'd have different right. tastes and preferences. They have disagreements among each other. Uh, but what they have in common is that what they did was uh, was important. And an educated man or woman today should should understand that this kind of very challenging and important work is still being created in this in this world that we live in. And that some of this work, I, I, you and I, I think, have found this, especially talking to people a little younger than us, uh, especially if it was done pre-internet, it has some tendency to disappear. I mean, not the most famous, perhaps, of these thinkers, but other really terrific thinkers, and Edward right. Bradfield or someone. That's right. You know, one purpose of this end, of this effort is to make their Get work. them out there in right. the blogosphere. Get people <laughs> well, reading them and arguing about them. Yeah, or at least make it... Or at it least a, accessible. Yes. Nice. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, and I think all, we, we think almost all their work is of contemporary significance. I mean, it's not, this is not only historically interesting if you're writing an essay on American thought in the 1950s, but that these are really people, someone interested in current questions of political philosophy, public policy, culture. These are writers who really can inform one's thinking. I would say that all of them, so, so almost all of them, uh, were quite famous in their time. Right. Uh, it was recognized that what they were doing was important. Uh, sometimes their work was greeted with incomprehension. It just seemed strange, right. outré. Uh, other times it seemed highly controversial. They were challenging the prevailing paradigm, uh, as we would say. So they were, uh, they were argued about. Now, some of them uh, have faded, and very few people today will know about them. Uh, others, uh, Hayek and Keynes, for you know, right. people are still people kn know those names, and they have a vague idea of what they uh, what they stood for. What's important is that uh, while their work was controversial, it has now uh, withstood uh, uh, among the oldest of them several generations of uh, vigorous debate and argument. 
Uh, so it has, it has lasted. And we go back to these works and we find out that they are, in some cases, uh, astoundingly uh, uh, topic, timely, topical, relevant, pertinent. Uh, uh, they turned out to be highly prescient. They were dealing with problems of 70 or 80 years ago, but they seem to be talking to us today. Yeah, the problems of the welfare state, modern mass democracy, foreign policy, and dealing with dictatorships, those, are, those haven't gone away, they, right? They haven't, they haven't gone away. If you go to Hayek's Constitution of Liberty, uh, written in, pub published in 1970, uh, you will find uh, uh, Hayek uh, was a, uh, he was in favor of a generous social state. He wanted a safety net against old age, uh, infirmity, poverty. Uh, he, he wanted uh, a very generous provision for uh, people's uh, health care, for example. Uh, but he was opposed to monopoly provision, for the governments forcing everybody uh, to accept these things uh, simply uh, uh, as a beneficence from the government he wanted to enable uh, people. Uh, if you read his chapters, they sound like the debates over Obamacare today, whether as the president uh, and his administration wants, uh, the government itself is going to provide these things and guarantee them and you come to the government for them, uh, or whether as the conservative reformers say uh, that we should uh, provide people with the means uh, to purchase and take care of their health uh, and make sure that everybody has those means but that the government isn't the monopoly provider of it. The debates, are, the d debates look like they come out of today's newspapers. And when you say, when you read these people, of course, that one, one I think, assumption, or not assumption, uh, one guiding principle of putting together these websites has been that they are worth, it's worth reading these people in the, orig in the original, in so the to original. speak. In the original, yes. Not simply reading a potted account of their thought in some book on like 20th century, you know, intellectual history or something like that. And I do think yes. the websites obviously provide access to their each, each, own Each work. site will have an introductory essay if you've never heard of this person, why, sh why are they important? Why should you pay attention? Uh, a bi a, a uh, biography of their life and times, the debates that they were engaged in, a complete bibliography, and the text of their most important works whenever we can get hold of them. Right. Uh, on a, if you have a website <coughs> devoted to uh, Machiavelli or Plato, uh, you don't have a copyright problem, and there are good texts that are out right. there. In this case, there are, a lot of the work is still in copyright, uh, but we are we're working diligently to secure rights to as much of the text as we can, and also the text of important uh, criticism and and commentary second, second uh, at level. a very high level of the work that they've done. Right, it's a curated curated bibliography, so it you know yes. it makes it a little easier to see their work on different topics and so forth. So in going over so many of these sites, I mean, what, what has struck you apart from, the, I mean, they're obviously important thinkers, very brilliant men uh, and women. Anything particular strike you just about sort of the, char the characteristic <coughs> of their intellectual work or? Uh, I, would, I would mention that uh, one thing that sets them, these people apart, uh, is, that, uh, their is that their work was extroverted. Hmm. Uh, some of them were Leo Strauss was a very introverted man. He lived his life in the, in, the, in the study and in the classroom. There are others that were advisors to presidents and were out there in the public press uh, all the time. Uh, but even, even those who were the most scholarly uh, were different from others that were working at the same time. And that they weren't wrestling with problems in the journals or in the books, right. they were primarily wrestling with problems out there in the world, the, the living world that they were part of. Now they may, they may have gone all the way back to Maimonides and Aristotle to find the answers, uh, but the purpose was not, uh, was not just the intellectual life for all of its satisfactions. Uh, it was because they were wrestling with, with big problems. They were trying to uh, confront the world uh, and uh, uh, correct correct its errors, uh, and uh, and uh, and ultimately to improve it. Even those that ended up being pessimist or pessimistic or 
uh, uh, or, or very skeptical. Uh, but they were, they were ambitious people. They were, they, they were people of very high ambition. And they were, they were creative. Uh, they often, they respected the past. They took seriously the institutions and public opinion in the world around them. But they were pretty confrontational characters. They had critical minds. They had original ways of thinking. And they were, as we say today, they were disruptive forces. Yeah. They were trying to change, to come, to come up with, they were, dis, right. they were dissatisfied in some respect and they wanted to come up with new ways of thinking. So their work was very, uh, was very challenging and bold. Now one has to be careful because while they were working over the past century, there were a lot of ambitious, bold, creative, radical thinkers whose ideas have not lasted and right. we haven't heard of them anymore or we've heard of them because their ideas caused a great deal of, of uh, harm uh, and hardship. But these are people who had those attributes uh, whose work has stood up to decade after decade of criticism as new people come along and try to uh, play king of the hill and you know knock them off the hill uh, and, uh, and, and, and they have lasted. So their, their disruption was like Microsoft versus IBM. It was not merely disruptive, but we now know that they created something new and valuable and worth paying attention to. Yeah, and for me what's striking is the point you made about uh, these are people who they were they engaged the academic literature and or other intellectuals of the time and often corrected it and made important contributions, but they were dealing with the world, not with the literature That's right. uh, of That's their right. field. That's and that right. is I think the current academy does push so many people into make your contribution or correct to or correction yes. of the literature. And students go to class and often the professors teach the literature. And I think one w big advantage of going back and reading these people's work is seeing an example of really trying to think through the problems that face them either in the immediate moment or more broadly or even forever, you know, in terms of uh, politics and human society and so forth. Uh, it really is an example of a kind of confrontation that you don't get so much in today's academic world, I think. You, you put your finger on uh, a distinctive uh, characteristic of these people, uh, which is that the academics among them, not all were academics, some were intellectuals, right. critics, novelists, uh, 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 but those who were academics, they, they were in their field of political science or philosophy, law, um, economics, in the case of Leon Cass, medicine. <clears throat> and they were masters of a discipline. They had, they had grasped a discipline whole, and then they moved beyond it. They, they, they didn't want to simply settle questions, tidy up methodological issues you know, within their discipline. They wanted to use their discipline as a tool and apply it in other fields. And one reason that their work was often initially very controversial is that they are, they're moving outside of their fields. And people in adjacent fields don't like it. And they were willing to be contrarian, I think, both in terms of Hi, their fields uh, and... Schumpeter had a theory of, of politics and democratic accountability which was radically different than those of the political scientists. And I'm told even today, uh, uh, his views tend to be dismissed. Although, to my way of thinking, as somebody who's lived in Washington for most of his life, uh, they are profoundly insightful. And if I look at the political scientists, I can see that a lot of them have picked up and spun, uh, spun around his work. Uh, but he, capitalism, democracy, uh, capitalism, Social. socialism, and democracy was a bestseller. The Road to Serfdom was a bestseller. Uh, Keynes was not quite such a bestseller, but his ideas about how to confront depression, an economic depression, uh, were, were captivating uh, and uh, moved to the forefront of practical policy debate uh, even in the 30s. And I think when one goes back, I was struck working, looking at the websites myself and, and reads the original, even if people, in many cases, I'd read before and thought I knew pretty well, there is something, um, if one then reads about them a lot, which of course one does just inevitably if they're famous, like Keynes or Hayek or uh, even people like Alan Bloom or Charles Murray, you read the sort of secondary literature, or not even literature, just comments and commentary. And obviously we preserve the best of that, we try to on the websites, but 
it often does get more homogenized than it really should be. And one loses the sharpness and the contrarianness and the real challenge that these thinkers pose. You know, now everyone puts them, well, so if you take a course in history of modern economic thought, well, here's the contribution of Keynes and here's the contribution of Hayek and here's Milton Friedman and they contradict, each, they disagree on some things, but they each have a place and kind of the string of fine economists. But that actually does blur, I think, the the real, uh, what's radical and bold about their thought and in a way makes people think less for themselves. That's the great advantage, I think, of going back to the originals in, in all these cases. I, I, I agree. Almost all, not all of them, but almost all of them are exceptionally lucid writers, yeah. beautiful writers. And just to be in their presence is a great uh, experience. <clears throat> one, of, one of the great teachings of uh, your teacher, Leo Strauss, is that when one comes to the text of somebody that you know is a great thinker, um, pay careful attention. Don't just come in and figure you know as much as this guy and you're going to start criticizing him, uh, but you're going to try to understand what he was about. When he's kicking up one controversy or avoiding another controversy, he or she, they knew what they were doing. They actually knew what they were doing, so just pay careful attention. And to go back uh, to the works of any of these people, and even recent writers, uh, uh, such as uh, Harvey Mansfield, a writer of great uh, subtlety, uh, uh, Martha Durthick, uh, writing about the problems of federalism in the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, you learn much more than you could learn from a summary of, of what they did right. in two or three sentences. And you learn how to think. You're actually, you're seeing how their mind works, and you think, well, um, I might try to do that. You know, not, not as well as they did maybe, but, uh, but that's the right approach. Well, if this stimulates uh, people to have the ambitions of these writers <laughs> and hopefully the success in some cases of them, that would be a great accomplishment. So thanks, Chris, for all the work you've done. And, putting together this uh, series and of websites. And thank you. It's been wonderful working with you putting it together, and I hope we find a lot of readers. I'm sure we will. I trust we will. Thanks.